All right, hi everybody. This is fun. I didn't realize today I was going to be in the big room with the microphone and everything. I always joke that I'm going to do some weird interpretive dance wearing some turtle costume. And I've never gone through with it, although there are pictures of there, out there floating um, of me wearing certain costumes. Um, but if I'd known I was going to be in this room today, I would have been really tempted to do it. Um, so maybe next year I'll get a heads up from Brett that I'll be in here and really put on a show for you guys. Um, today, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you. Um, I really just want to have kind of an open conversation about really high level, so not technical at all, just about what our program is, what it does, highlight a few species and projects that we're working on um, in the area as well as statewide. Um, I do encourage you, there's going to be a couple other of my colleagues today that are going to be talking um, this morning um, in the second session. Um, Josh is going to be talking a more focused, detailed discussion on some of the turtle work that we're doing. And then this afternoon, Heidi Holman is a biologist with Fish and Game that's going to be talking about butterflies. Um, I do want to take a second that, that uh, just acknowledges Sam. I don't know if he's in the room right now, but what an amazing keynote talk this morning. Um, I was totally getting my nerd on and uh, appreciated it so much. Um, and I love the fact that when people highlight kind of the underdog species is what I call them, ones that get overlooked and um, undervalued for the roles that they play in our ecosystems. Um, so I'm Melissa Winters. Um, I am a certified wildlife biologist with Fish and Game. I talk a lot, so I'm going to do my best to get through slides today. Um, but I'm also going to be saying a lot of things, so I'm going to apologize if it seems scattered. But there's a lot of stuff I want to share with you guys. Um, and so at any time, feel free to raise your hand, ask any questions. I'm open to, um, to anything, honestly. Like I said, I want this to be useful for you guys. So broadly, again, high overview of what is it that we do and talking about some of our projects as well as things that you can do to help. We, um, so in New Hampshire in 1979, adopted or enacted the um, Endangered Species Conservation Act. So the federal one, which everybody is, for the most part, I'm guessing in this room familiar with, was enacted in 1973. New Hampshire went ahead and adopted one in 1979, which is also referenced or referred to as RSA 212A. In 1980, following that adoption, we developed and, and um, put out there our first threatened endangered um, species list. Um, so just to take a step back, the Endangered Species Conservation Act for New Hampshire is actually very similar to the federal one. There's a lot of language that we adopted from that and put in our own state document. And what that did is it's a statute that allows us to promote and develop programs like ours. Um, to essentially focus on the management and protection of the state's rare resources, specifically the rare wildlife resources. Um, it wasn't until 1988, though, until our program was established and started off with one staff person. Over the last 30 years, we've grown to a whopping seven, I have to redo numbers, seven full-time staff people, five temporary staff people, and during the summer, we are lucky to bring on some grunt laborers known as our field staff, which are amazing people. Um, so what is it that we do? I mentioned the Endangered Species Conservation Act, but I want to take it a step um, higher than that in that we monitor and manage the protection efforts for the state's wildlife that are hunted, fished, or trapped. So that goes beyond just those that are threatened and endangered. That's talking about essentially all wildlife that is not considered um, a game species. And just to put that in perspective, we have an estimated 570 wildlife species in the state of New Hampshire. About 70 of those species are fish species. About 30 of those are game species, which results in about 470 of those species are non-game species, which again include those that are endangered and are threatened, species of special concern. Um, but just to highlight, that doesn't include the thousands of invertebrates, arachnids, insects, such as those that we talked about this morning. Um, so those are the ones that, that our wonderful, cute little program um, is in charge of managing. So that's a, that's a lot of animals. We stay pretty busy. 
Um, currently, we have a list that was established in 2017. That's our latest revision for our threatened and endangered species wildlife list. And so currently in the state, there are 30 wildlife species that are considered endangered, 21 that are considered threatened, and 62 that are considered species of special concern, meaning that they have the likelihood or the potential to become threatened and are endangered. Um, and again, we talked about that there's thousands of species out there that aren't listed, but that we still work to manage. Um, you know, the discussion this morning highlighted kind of the biodiversity, the interdependency of these animals on each other. So it's important that we're kind of keeping our eye out for everybody. What else do we do? Well, we conduct research. We actually are out there actively collecting data on a lot of our species. We work very closely with other state and federal partners, non-government organizations, universities, local governments, and various other partners, such as the Harris Center, New Hampshire Audubon, um, other entities like that, with our sole purpose of providing conservation or working on implementation of conservation actions for wildlife species. We develop guidance based on the information that we find or through our, research, our, our partners um, guidance on habitat management, best management practices on how to avoid or minimize impacts to these species. And we put out educational materials and do things like what we're doing today to talk to you about what it is that we do, as well as presenting some of our research to you. Um, and we also go out and have fun and do classroom stuff too, which is really cool. Um, we manage the Reptile and Amphibian Reporting Program, which is also known as Wildlife Sightings nowadays. Um, this was something that back in the 1990s, we created a web-based platform that encourages not just research entities, um, but folks like you to submit your observations of wildlife out on the landscape. There is honestly a small portion of New Hampshire that we have access to, um, to go out and, uh, you know, research or, or inventory properties and so we depend a lot on the observations that you make on your properties or on hikes that you do as well as you know maybe you got some friends that are landowners that don't want anybody out there but you can get out there do it um, and then tell me about it um, we work closely with the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources which houses all that data that we get from you and actually our research too um, so the Natural Heritage Database, which many of you may or may not be familiar with, but it's essentially a collaborative effort where we house both plant information, which comes from DNCR, vegetation, habitat, things like that, and then we upload and keep all of our, our wildlife records in that database. Um, there are numerous entities that the Natural Heritage um, Bureau works with, Nature Serve is one of them, that use that data to go beyond our state's boundaries, to feed national databases and look at trends and populations and issues from a much broader perspective than just locally. Um, and then we have an environmental review program within our unit that works to um, look at proposed projects, um, that may have impacts on our wildlife species and provide uh, information and um, feedback on those projects pertaining to, like I said, the potential impacts they might have on the rare wildlife. That program also goes beyond that, though, and does provide information to, say, universities um, regarding research they're doing, it helps, you know, give information to um, partners like the USDA when they're doing forestry management plans. So there's a lot of stuff that, um, that comes out of that program that's not just specific to development projects. What guides our work is this document that's called the uh, Wildlife Action Plan, New Hampshire Wildlife Action Plan. Um, it is an amazing document that always blows my mind when I pick it up and start looking through it. It's huge. Um, but the amount of information that's in this is, is just, like I said, it, it talks about all the species within the state, wildlife species and plant species, plant communities, um, that are considered, you know, species of greatest conservation needs. So you may have heard of that phrase. That's looking at threatened and endangered species, species of special concern, as well as those animals that just from a long-term perspective, we're starting to see their populations 
or critical habitats that they need to, in order to um, maintain on the landscape, go into a gradual decline. So this looks at all of those individually, and this document says pretty much we lay out in there what is it that we know about them, what is it that we've identified their needs within our state, what is it that we don't know about them. Um, and so we use this kind of as our guide to move forward and identify what are, where are our research priorities. It also provides a ton of good information on the trends of what our landscape is looking like in New Hampshire um, over time. This document is revised every 10 years, and it is a document that, as a program, we are required to have if we want to be eligible for federal funding. Um, I will take one step aside to say little, maybe little known fact, our program runs almost primarily on grant funds um, and donations from the public. We receive very little state support, and what we do get, we need to make and match through donations. So there's my donation plea for everybody to give us all your money. Um, and, and land, we'll take that too. Um, and that goes to help support when we do go after a lot of, like I said, federal grants to support the research that we're doing. We are um, required to have match monies in, in our account to be able to do that. So, um, as well as this document that says, hey, we've, we've done the basic base work, we've, um, we've identified these are species that need help or that we need to find out more about in our state. Um, I'm going to jump into very high level a couple projects or species that you guys might be interested in just so, you know, we have to talk about animals, we're here, wildlife after all, um, and just introduce you to our website. I will fully admit that there is some clunkiness to our website, I would love we all would love who work there to update it and make it super fancy and wonderful. Um, our website does have links to a lot of the work that we're doing with our partners, and so um, I do encourage you to go there and check it out. Um, if you do see something on here that isn't updated or that you would like additional information on, please let us know. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to catch what we need to update in here, but I actually found a ton of things when I was looking at it last night, so that's why I'm apologizing to you that I am behind on a lot of stuff. Um, but we have links to a lot of the active projects or some of the results of the projects that we've worked on over the last few years um, on this web page here, as well as links to other, you know, like I said, regional um, priorities and research that's going on. Um, this is where I'm gonna jump into a couple things going on in the state. Again, high level, just throwing out a couple of things. Bats is something that I think most people are interested in. Gotten a lot of attention since white nose syndrome came out or was discovered in 2009 when pretty much everybody started to see incredibly sharp declines in bat populations. And so bats is, is a species that I thought would be good. Everybody can relate to them and is aware of them. Um, and, and just to let you know that it is, it is a species that we do active research on. Um, we in New Hampshire have eight species of bats that occur here, and four of those are considered state endangered species. The four that are considered state endangered species are also the ones that we consider year-round residents. And they utilize a variety of habitats from forested areas during the summers to structures and or more primarily um, mines and caves to further overwintering. Um, this is just, oh, oh, I just love cute pictures. I do pictures a lot. Um, there is a way for you guys to get involved. Oh, I will say, I'm sorry, that um, we still don't have a lot of information on bats. We are actively going out there into the mines and caves, doing you know, population estimates, looking at what white nose looks like currently in our state. Um, I will say that I am not the bat biologist, but we are still seeing significant declines in our populations, and white nose is still prevalent. Um, and as of right now, there still isn't an effective treatment for it. So bats is still a hot, hot topic um, that we'll probably sadly be talking more about well into the future. Um, and currently, we are still seeing declines across all species everywhere. Um, we do, this is, these are maps out of our wildlife action plan that we put together for all species if we have the information. Some of the bats, if you were to flip through the book to look at, um, we just kind of have broad brush statewide distributions. Those are kind of broad estimates of where we think they may be, um, or that because there's habitat available. 
Um, I want to highlight this because we're going to show this on a couple other slides that kind of focus in on the area that we're talking about today. Um, and that these maps kind of sh do show where we do have evidence or known documented populations or presence of species in the state. So this is where you can go to get that local information about what's in your essentially backyard. Um, a way to participate in BAT, um, uh, to help with our BAT project is to do BAT summer counts. And these are very simple to do. There's a lot of information on our website that includes the form and essentially methods of how to do this. Thank you. I am. We're in trouble, but that's okay. I'll just talk faster. Um, bats, go out, count them. <laughs> um, racers, I have to highlight a snake just because I'm a snake person. Um, we do have records of black racers here over in this area of the state. Um, we've been doing active research on racers for over a decade now and have found that they actually like a variety of different habitats and have fairly large ranges over a mile, actually. Um, they can hibernate, in, uh, they communally hibernate, meaning that they gather to one or two central locations and can utilize a variety of different habitats for their overwintering. Um, they are very susceptible to threats during both their active and inactive seasons. Um, and this is kind of where their distribution is here. Again, I'm showing you these maps because I'm encouraging and hoping that this encourages you guys to um, report your observations um, because this is what feeds our information and kind of cues us into where do we need to focus our research efforts. I will, again, guilty of it, reptiles, amphibians, which is kind of my thing, um, talk about rare turtles for just a moment. Again, you're going to be hearing a talk shortly um, from a colleague who's going to be talking in more detail on some of our projects, but we are currently doing research or collecting data on four of our rare turtle species here in New Hampshire three of which the Blandings, Wood, and Spotted Turtles are all considered right now um, federally pe uh, petitioned for federal listing. So we are doing active research with them as well as, as well as working with other state and regional partners and actually international partners, folks from Canada that are helping us all gather a whole bunch of information to find out what's going on with these animals. Um, habitat loss, road mortality are kind of the two biggies, sadly. Um, this is an example of some of the websites that you will find links to that as regional groups we develop to provide more detailed information on the research that we're doing. And so um, we have ones available on all of these species that goes into much more detail about what it is that we're doing for all of these across, again, our region. Um, and I do have links of this on our website to find out more information. A uh, couple examples of some of the best management practices and guidance documents that we develop through the research. Again, warned you, I'm going to talk about our focus on turtles um, and snakes because that's what I do. Um, but just as an example of some of the products that come out of the research that we do that we provide to you guys to kind of help you help us. Thank you. Um, and we do, uh, like I said, work with a lot of partners. In this particular case, there is an active program that the USDA is doing for at-risk species. Um, turtles are considered an at-risk species. And so they're promoting land owners to do a lot of practices that help promote or um, protect these animals in the landscape. And so we, with them, work together to also create educational documents and um, best management guidance information for um, landowners. Um, I just had, threw up a couple maps of some of these species distributions in the state currently. I forgot to put the little circle in the area, so you guys will have to draw that in with your brains. Um, but here's wood turtles as well as um, spotted and blandings, which I talked about earlier. And you're going to hear a little bit more information on eastern box turtles um, in a talk later this morning. Data gaps, again, this is where you guys come into play to kind of help us fill in some of the information through what you're seeing on the landscape. And there's a lot of data gaps that we have, honestly, throughout the whole state, but there's quite a few in your area, so pressure's on people. Um, you report this, again, through our Wildlife Sightings website, and again, I will apologize, it's a clunky website, but it is what we have, and we're working on improving it. I do want to do a shout out to say that if you report your sightings to things like Thank you. Um, 
eBird or Herp Mapper, some of those websites, we do not have access to their data. So I don't think that people realize that, that we only can access what we have permission to access, which is our own database. So if you do report your observations and sightings to other entities, I will never see that information and it won't necessarily go to helping, you know, your local site-specific research concerns that you have in your neighborhood. Um, here's the website here. It's pretty uh, self-explanatory. Log in, create a login, and upload a whole bunch of good stuff. <sighs> okay, we'll do this. We're, we got this. I'm going to like cut in a minute or two into questions. All right. Um, important thing about reporting your observations, photographs. Please include photographs. We have a lot of animals that kind of look the same or may look different at different life stages. And so that helps us identify or confirm the species that you see, as well as the location and um, dates and any fun things that you note about them when you go out and see them. All this, again, is explained on our website. Um, things that you might think we don't know or don't care about, um, but I want to point out is even the sad stuff. Report sad things like road mortality. Again, that helps lead our efforts to identifying problem areas where maybe we need to do wildlife crossings or you know, put up signage or roadblocks, um, pitfall traps. No, I'm just kidding. Don't tell people I said that. But um, you know, to, like, it, to focus our efforts on where our problem areas are. Um, I just threw a couple maps. I'm going to go through these really quick because we are out of time. I'm getting glaring eyes. Okay, you're not glaring, but I'm going to pretend you are just to make myself feel nervous. Um, to go through a couple more slides on some of the other species. And again, I'm just mostly shaming you all to show you that there are data gaps and that I want more information from all of you or that we want more information on what you guys are seeing out there. Um, all of this, again, is on our website. You can click on a species and you'll have access to all this information about whatever we know, you will know, top secret information, it's all there for you. Um, vernal pools, <clears throat> just a shout out that we want information on vernal pools. These are vital resources, vital features and landscapes that we don't have a lot of information on, um, but they are key features that are required for the survival of so many of our species. Um, and so we encourage you to get out there and document them and provide us with the information which you can upload to our Wildlife Sightings website. Uh, and then I guess, I'm gonna skip through a couple slides. I knew I was gonna do this. Um, we have, uh, I do wanna shout out really quick just to point out a couple other features of the Wildlife Action Plan. Um, that I think are important to note, that I think are useful to you guys, and I'm hoping that most of you are here because you want to learn about where can I find more information. Um, our website has so many links to maps, community-specific maps and databases, um, Excel files that essentially list any species that we know that occurs in your area, what type of habitat exists. We do a ton of work in mapping. I don't do the mapping, but we have a genius that does that looks and pulls in any new information that we can about what's happening on the landscape and where are important features um, that we need to focus conservation efforts on. And so you can look this up, download all this information. It's at your fingertips. Use it, use it, use it. Um, locally, go out and harass your conservation commissions and planning and zoning. And if you're members of those, sorry, love you. Um, we like to work with you on doing stuff. Um, you know, here's an example of Keen. I just pulled up a Keen spreadsheet. It shows you any bird, any amphibian, any reptile that you guys have there and the type of habitat it needs. So you have a lot of stuff that you guys can use to help doing land use planning. And land use planning is honestly the most key, important conservation action anybody can do. Land um, habitat loss is, is one of the biggest issues. Are you guys, ta you guys are talking about me? It's okay. I know, I know, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, more information, New Hampshire Wildlife Corridors is out there, it's a new, um, it's actually just been recently released, provides a ton of information on, again, key areas, key habitat, where you guys need to focus some of your efforts on conservation. Um, just some pictures of good stuff like that. Um, and that's actually it. I'm gonna just stop there because I know, I know, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of talking. 
I don't even know if we have time for questions. Of course. Yes, and I did put, I always like to bring presents and treats, so I put some documents on the windowsill over there that has some examples of some of the publications that we put out that you guys are welcome to help yourself to. Thank you. Thank you.